I'm going to call the meeting to order at seven o'clock then. Uh, it's good seeing you all. Hope you had a nice holiday, uh, survived the virus so far, and prosperous new year, or at least bright, bright prospects for this year. Um, so uh, we have nobody from the, the public for comments, so I'm going to move down the agenda to number three, approval of the meeting uh, minutes from December 14th. Uh, does anybody have any uh, comments with respect to the, the minutes from last meeting or can we move to approve? I that, will move to approve the minutes. Get a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, unanimously approved. Okay, Nancy, I guess that leaves you up. Okay, um, a couple of my things will be in later in some of our later discussions, but um, things are, are moving along. We worked on, oh, Nicole confirms no public. So um, we have worked to compile our statistics from last year. Of course, our statistics from last year bear you know, no resemblance to a normal year's statistics. So even though we're going to report them to the state library like we always do, um, I don't think anyone's ever going to use 2020 as a comparison year to see how we compared to other years. <laughs> that said, I think we've done pretty admirably. It looks like we've circulated about 625,000 items this past year, even though we were um, we had greatly reduced hours and were closed entirely for a couple months there, and and had very staff intensive um, delivery of services. So our we hit a record, I believe, the year before in 2019, we're at about a million one. So it is a little more than half of, of normal, but considering the circumstances, I'm pleased with that. We also delivered in the, from the advent of closing on March 13th, for, because of COVID to the end of 2020, we delivered about 38,000 plus items through curbside delivery. So um, that's a lot. And actually, even though some days were slower or, or more busy than others, um, we had quite a few days where, and we, do, we continue to now, where we deliver more than, we serve more than one patron a minute on curbside for, ever, for all of the hours that were open. So I think that's better than most fast food establishments. We're really doing a good job with curbside. We started a new service this week that to our surprise and delight has been immensely popular. It's called a pick a topic bag. And that's exactly what it sounds like. We were doing that anyway, but we gave it a name and publicized it and people are really jumping on it. So basically you can go through our website and click on a button or there are numbers that you can call also link to the website. And basically you pick a topic, you know, since we're not able to let browsers in right this minute, you know, someone can call up and say, hey, I'm, I've really been into Italian cooking lately. What do you have? And then our library staff will find you five to 10 items on, on Italian cooking. Uh, it is immensely popular with parents of young kids who are tired of reading the same things over and over and over, who call us up now and say, oh, please, you know, give me, give me six or seven new books that have something to do with a shark or a train, for example. So we are um, taking suggestions on what people are looking for, browsing for them, putting things in kind of a surprise grab bag. And it's just started on Tuesday. And I don't know how many we've had, but our table that's um, set up to put the bags on so that we can take them out and deliver them through curbside is, is full to bursting. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, trying to still advance our online programs. We don't know how long it will be until we're able to do in-person programs again. Um, in answer to the question of why we are not reopened yet, this is a, a very common question we get as the COVID numbers start to go in a positive direction downward. Um, the answer is that we are awaiting our carpet. Our carpet is on order. Things were delayed somewhat in our carpeting project because we discovered as we pulled up a few carpet squares to investigate what was going around some larger cracks on our terrazzo floor. 
we found that we have a network of cracks that look like that looks like we've had a small earthquake. So we have a lot of cracks in our floor that have to be filled. So it is not dissimilar from the cracking that was found next door in the Civic Center. Ours are apparently not as bad as in some of the other buildings, but they still have to be filled with an epoxy um, substance before we put the carpet on top. So we didn't fling the door open yet because we didn't want to open it up, move everything, close it back up, open it back up because we find that our patrons are, um, or at least a while ago, were a little bit confused and frustrated with the open, close, open, close. So right now we are, we were hoping to have a meeting with the construction folks, the carpet folks and the furniture and book moving people tomorrow but they will probably not be on site doing what they were going to be doing most of the day because of the snow. So that may be put off till next week. In the meantime, our carpet's on order. We can't wait to get the new carpet. Um, the most common description of our current old carpet is dirty horse hoof prints. Um, and that's, I thought it sort of looked like amoebas under a microscope, but the dirty horse, print, horse hoof prints pretty much fit. So we will be really happy to have new carpet and new flooring. Um, new washable flooring in our staff kitchen and our meeting room kitchen and our children's craft room. But that is why we are not yet open. We expect to be carpeted within the next couple of weeks and, and be able to move back in. If you haven't been around before on any sort of um, carpeting project in a major building, I can tell you that in a library, it's a pretty complex thing to do. So. We have to have professional movers that are used to moving library things that come in and load the library books onto double-sided wheeled carts, shrinky wrap them and take them out. Usually what happens is they put them in a semi, um, load them up so that they're sitting outside while the areas are recarpeted and then they bring them back in and put them back on the shelf, hopefully in perfect order. But it does take a while to, as you can imagine, to take all the books off the shelves and move the shelves. So. Um, we're, we're glad we're not doing the whole thing at once. I've done that before and we're just doing the first floor. So you'll see nice new carpet in the entries, the staff areas, the children's and teens area and the meeting room. So we are happy that that project is almost underway. Um, other than that, staff's doing really well. Um, knock on wood, we, have, we haven't had any recent COVID cases or even quarantine cases. So we're knocking on wood that it stays that way until such time as the vaccine is more readily available to, to our staff. There is some discussion going on um, in Colorado, in the state library and among libraries. Um, depending on where you are, library workers are either considered frontline workers or they're not as far as the vaccine goes. So in some areas they have fit into the vaccine um, classification of 1B, which is the same as teachers, grocery store workers, et cetera. And in a lot of areas, we're just kind of lumped in with all the rest of the municipal workers. So um, I've asked public health, I don't have a response yet um, about what'll happen with, with our folks that work at the library, but there is definitely a disparity. We are now considered to be an essential service, but our staff is not considered, are not considered to be essential workers. So there seems like there's a little bit of a, of a strange disparity there. So um, that is pretty much what I know until we get into a couple of our other specific topics in old business. Okay, any uh, questions for Nancy on that information? None? Uh, friends of the library report? Um, I don't have a report yet. They have not met for January. They'll meet Wednesday. So I'll have a report at the next meeting. Okay, uh, council liaison report. You probably wish I had no report, but I do. <laughs> Actually, let, let me just tell you the topics that you can tell me if you have any interest in them. Um, <clears throat> tomorrow night, we're gonna approve uh, $877,000 in, in uh, <clears throat> grants to nonprofits uh, through, from, based on recommendations from our housing and human, human services advisory board. Uh, we've got our short-term rental ordinance changes, which we've talked about, I think, in the past. Uh, there's a growing interest and concern about air quality and what our options are uh, for 
or what our limits are in terms of regulating or accountability for uh, oil and gas operators who, who might be contributing to um, to diminished or toxic air uh, toxic air lower quality air. Um, and then I think our, our focus is going to continue to gain, I don't know, more energy. Uh, um, our post-pandemic future will gain more energy and what it will take for the city of Longmont to recover quickly with resilience and potentially differentiate Longmont from other front range communities in terms of um, optimism and opportunities and, and um, stability in the, in the post-pandemic future. And I do think, uh, I know I see you're going to, uh, Nancy's going to talk about the feasibility study. Mm -hmm. I do think the feasi two feasibility studies become a central part of that discussion. And to that end, um, I've, I've prob uh, probed a little bit or maybe uh, prodded a little bit uh, with the Longmont Economic Development Partnership uh, to, st to start to get their attention on what the possibilities are between what happens with the performing arts feasibility study and the library feasibility study and, and, and what are the, the, what's the potential of bringing together some uh, big ideas and a big opportunity that will come along only once for this community and what that could mean um, kind of as a lead opportunity in the post-pandemic future. So um, there aren't a lot of details until we get feasibility studies, but I just think we need to start getting people primed and excited about what's coming and, and see what could be integrated here in a way that gets us more than we might have, more than we might enjoy and more support than we might be able to generate if we look at these two just totally independent. So I'll stop. That's, you know, if you have questions about any of that stuff or want to follow up, I'm happy to do so. I, I have um, one or two questions on the uh, other feasibility study. What is the pace of that? When do you expect deliverables from that? Um, I wish I could tell you. Um, there have been, it's interesting, we have two, two, two pretty significant feasibility studies going on. And, and for, our, for, the, for our locals, both our, in this case, Nancy, in the other case, it's not so much staff, it's, it's community members. Um, there are some, there's some disappointment uh, in the consultants on both both projects, mm -hmm. um, so the the timeline on that one has been affected not only by the virus, it certainly has by the by the pandemic, but also by concerns mm -hmm. with the consultants and and what they're producing. So <clears throat> I got a, a pretty a pretty detailed update from uh, Bob Balsman, who's the who's the lead in the performing arts uh, community on that study. Um, my guess is we'll get that one in, in advance of the library feasibility study, but I don't think there's a date certain. Um, and I know there's a lot of back and forth on what it is uh, they're getting ready to recommend and, uh, and what the, we can do with that, what the, what the interested parties are going to be able to do with it. So I, I wish, Mark, I wish I could tell you it's, you know, the end of February or but I, to my knowledge, there is no hard uh, uh, deliverable date uh, to my knowledge. So. Well, I don't think we want to stick our nose in what they're doing, but do you see uh, a point in um, their progress and our progress when we should be talking to one another? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. <laughs> That's part of, I've been trying to signal that for a while. I think... Uh, let me add, there's one more little variable, not, not a little, one more big variable here, and that is um, there's an investor group. Um, I think they're trying to, they're, I think they're talking about their fund as the Evergreen Fund um, uh, that is trying to generate interest and investors uh, in a fund to make investments, one or more, in the Opportunity Zone, which is all that area north of, uh, of, this, of, this, of the same brain, right, from the sugar mill all the way to Hover. Um, all that work we did on the STEAM project is all in the Opportunity Zone. Um, so um, that's where I've started some of this conversation is if, if you're building, if, if you're building a, an investment fund um, and you're gonna look for opportunities, these two feasibility studies are gonna present a pretty interesting 
pretty interesting. Maybe and maybe the biggest opportunity you'll ever have. Uh, now, how how well it's going to match up with what their interests are, Mark? I don't know, but I know the the, the the initial response has been to say, well, let's we ought to learn more about this and and see what the possibilities are. And when the time comes, absolutely, this group, friends of the library, the, the our our primary employers in town. I mean, there's a there are a number of of parties that need to be brought together to say, look, you know, let's just explore what's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to, if you want to make a, a big, bold presentation to the community about how you could get whatever this group might decide it wants, whether it's that's a, a library district or a dedicated sales tax and keep the library inside the context of the city structure, that's going to be based on what the feasibility study brings and what you all decide you want to recommend. Um, and I'll support whatever you're going to recommend. Um, but I, this is not unlike, in my mind, not unlike what we envisioned the, the possibility mm -hmm. could have been with the, with the pool and ice facility mm -hmm. uh, and putting that together with a, with, a, with a proposed library district at the time, right? That didn't come together. Mm -hmm. In this case, you put the library together with the Performing Arts and Conference Center and you have a, a pretty large percentage of the community whose interest you could get, I think, some enthusiasm uh, and you could get a two for you could get two big results with with one proposed uh, tax increase. So, so how does this coalescing occur in your mind? The, well, I think the, we're going to have to put together uh, at the time. There's going to have to be a, a group brought together of all those interests to kind of map out what the possibilities or, are. Or will citizens or will the city do that? Well, I don't think the city will do that. Not, and I don't think the city will do it as a as a government entity. I think it's going to take it'll take council members. It's going to take the leadership from this board. It'll take the leadership from the performing arts community, and then making a connection with um, I think probably through the Longmont Economic Development Partnership. Um, I think that I think they'll have a keen interest. I know some of their board members are already interested, but it'll it'll be a it'll be a group that has to be brought together. With opportunities laid out, and, I, and the mayor can do that. The, um, the leadership of LABP with the mayor, with friends of the library, and with the leadership of this on this board. Okay, so um, this seems to be in line with some of the thoughts that came out of that Envision Longmont discussion a couple years ago. The, You're talking the, about the steam project, or Master plan. Master plan for the growth of Longmont, principally the Main Street corridor, but I think it extended beyond that and it involved cultural centers and yeah. hotels and yeah. expanded library services and what have you. Um, does that, how does that fit in, do you think? Well, everything, everything that, that we're talking about right now uh, fits pretty well pretty well with Envision Longmont, as well as what we did with the STEAM project a couple of years ago. Uh, there's nothing that's, that's a disconnect or, or is kind of un, unaligned with that. And, and, and you're right, the Main Street corridor plan, which is now being translated into actual planning documents, same thing is gonna happen this year with the STEAM initiative. Um, all, that, all that is real congruent with you know what? What I'm envisioning as a possibility, and I know others are as well. Yeah, I was just probing for co fellow constituents. You know, when when the coalescing occurs, of course, you want to bring in as many people as you can. I think to make it yeah. work, it's just casting about for who that might be. Well, I think I think initially, Mark, I think it'll be leadership from from this group from the performing arts group and, and business leadership in town uh, who are gonna have to come together. They'll have, that'll have, somebody's gonna have to trigger that. Um, and that's where the city or the mayor could play a role, or, you know, or your elected officials could play a role. Um, but it, it will be a, yeah, well, it will, it's gonna have to, it, 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 my, there's a variety of ways it could happen. At the very least, it will have to be a confederation of some kind, right? Um, or a collaboration among the leadership um, of, of interested groups and to see whether or not 
with some facilitation, um, a plan comes out of that that could be coherent and um, and and um, uh, I guess I don't know what better word popular enough or compelling enough with the community to take it seriously. And, and, and do you think this might be a actionable item in the second quarter? Uh, probably, I don't know. I, I, the second quarter, yeah, maybe. But by the end of, yeah, by the end of May or June, yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions for the councilman? Thanks, thanks for all that. Councilman Waters. Okay, that, that gets us through our normal um, list of items, uh, unless there are any additional comments on any of those. And with that, I'll move to uh, old business and the biggest item on, under old business courses, where it should be with you, Nancy. So okay. why don't you help so, us out? This fits right in with what Tim was just talking about. So um, I have spoken with multiple consultants, um, one at length since we last met. I have finished redoing our kind of feasibility study phase two RFQ, our request for quotes. So that is on its way off through purchasing and through Karen's office and you know other city folks that will will look through that. So um, definitely made some some changes on what we want to see as deliverables in this second phase, uh, which is going to consist mostly of the things that we felt weren't delivered in the first phase. Um, a lot of what we're really looking for, we have a whole, you know, what we got from the first consultant really amounted to a big giant pile of data. And so, you know, what we want going forward is the consultant to come in and extrapolate from this data um, what makes the most sense moving forward for the library. So um, we've asked them to do basically, you know, what, look at the data, um, what would be a low, a median, and an optimal level of service standard for things like um, building size, staffing, collection size, you know, all those parameters. So that shouldn't take too long for, for the consultants to do. I've talked to several who, have, who I've worked with before have done that very well. But then to take the next step, what we really need is what does that mean? So how do we get there? What are the different ways to get there? Um, there's a district, there's a city, and there's a hybrid. So we really want them to go off into those territories and say, what type of funding mechanisms are available for those different entities. So, you know, is there a dedicated tax um, as a municipal library? Is there a district with its financial ramifications and also a difference in governance? Um, is there a hybrid model? And I know that some exist, for example, where you have a municipal library with a governing board, which gives you more flexibility in uh, policy formation, um, in some of the decisions that you make moving forward. So uh, we really want them to take all that giant pile of data that we collected, a lot of community input and say, okay, here's what we've heard from the community surveying about how people want to, to um, see us move forward, but what does it cost and what are the mechanisms and you know, break that down into the graphs and charts of this is what it looks like for your average taxpayer moving forward. Um, the Original consultant survey pretty much said, you know, that you can't pay for what you're going to need in the future with, with the city's general fund budget, which I think, Tim, I've heard you say it like 37 times, and I agree with you because I've probably said it more often than that. So, so looking at what funding mechanisms are out there, looking at what the budget is that we need to provide these updates to services, technology, space, et cetera, that information is pretty readily available. Um, the consultants that I spoke with did not think that this process would be um, nearly as lengthy as the original consultants took to compile data. Um, so I think, Tim, we're talking only about a couple of months for someone else to come in and, and put together mm -hmm. what we need. So 
and I have found several consultants who are interested and available. So um, trying to line up our ducks so that when this is ready to, when this is, this RFQ is ready to go out, we will have a definitive date by which it has to be returned. And we, that, I, that I hope to know pretty shortly. So we, we're making progress. Ready to move forward. Great. Questions, Katie? Do you think that there's any change given the pandemic? I mean, I know. Yeah. I do. Ideally, uh, we're coming out of it, but not for a little while, at least. There, there is. And, you know, I think that that is a, a um, portion of information that I've added to the request for quotes and said, yeah. you know, here's what we envisioned pre-COVID. And, you know, some things, so we have a little addendum of, of basically the changes in library service since the advent of COVID. You know, for example, you know, we have a lot of patrons asking us to even when we are fully reopened, continue some of our, on, you know, more of our online services. So we've had some of our online programs and services that have proven immensely popular. So there's going to be, I think, a sustained demand for those. For example, bilingual story times. You know, so many people have said, can we please have these online, um, you know, even when COVID is, is hopefully done. So, um, and just, just kind of the way we do some things, um, the fact that that we've been talking about the digital divide in libraries for more than 15 years, and that that it's only now really with the advent of COVID that people are taking that seriously, and really mm -hmm. understanding that people who don't have internet access really don't have internet access, and and even folks who have internet access, you know, maybe they're doing work at home and they they can't print, they can't do things. So, you know, seeing things where they were used to dropping by the library. Um, so I think the way we use our space, our concept of how we use our space has changed and just seeing how many folks have really been just um, at their wits ends during COVID, during this period of unemployment, et cetera, and recognizing that this is the, you know, this is the first library I've worked in in 15 years that doesn't do computer classes just about every day of the week. We will do that um, post COVID. You know, we're, we're, already looking at basically how to rearrange the furniture and, and you know, drop power so we can make a different computer lab and, and teach classes. So I think that it has changed our focus moving forward. So uh, I have a question. So when these, the uh, consultant, whoever that is, is ready to present findings, um, will they, um, well, let me back up. Okay. The, the first set of consultants we had had a series of um, report outs mm -hmm. to try and um, gain acceptance or communicate the findings of the report. How do you see the, these new sets of consultants gaining that same communication um, channel to the community? I have expectations of a, of a totally different product. And I guess the product that I am looking for from the second consultant is um, quite similar to the pro and product that we ended up with when I was in Bellingham, Washington. And you know, the consultants um, came out, they talked to the board, but they also did the presentation to council. And you know, they, they did a lot, they had a lot of visuals, they had a package of, so it was, um, I think a lot more cohesive and a lot more visual. So you could see, you know, graphically, here's where here's where our library is, here's where it should be, here's where it is compared to peer libraries. Here is what someone who owns a house with this value would pay in taxes to get a low, median, or optimal level of service. It's very um, it's not as much just a compilation of of statistics and community input as it is output. This is what this translates to. So I would thoroughly expect them to do a professional presentation or presentations. Well, that sounds great. I hope they're, they're um, able to do all that because I think that'll really help. I think, I think I know a couple of them who have told me that they have availability and who are completely capable of doing so. Good. So. 
Okay, any other questions for Nancy on this one? Very good, Nancy. I look forward to, to getting the uh, final final. Me too. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, I uh, asked to have this discussion on the Moser and the Empson funds added. I mean, we talked a little bit about this um, last meeting, of course. I guess uh, I have a couple questions uh, before just some general discussion. I assume that uh, two thousand dollar check was cut loose, and you're good with your re uh, reference material, no right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, I um, went back in my notes, and in addition to what we said was in the Empson Fund in September. Back in May 2018, there was almost a million two hundred thousand in the Moser fund. So between those two funds, there's close to four million dollars. The the fund, but it's not all accessible. I understand yeah. that, but some of there it's is, the there corpus. Is. Yeah. Some of it's the corpus, and some of it you can exactly. Forward. Although some of the information that the councilman sent out suggested that you can. Council can rewrite the rules so they can dip into the body of the, the fund as well. It's it's there. I mean, they can do that, I think, is my interpret. Anyway, so um, my my point in all that was that's a lot of money, mm -hmm. four million bucks. And um, I, this is the discussion part. Is there a role for our group in, in terms of making recommendations to council as to how to broaden or change the bequest guidelines so that it's more practical for use by the library when the library has a appropriate and approved project? For, for instance, I think the Empson Fund is tied to research material, and I think the Moser Fund is tied to uh, learning disabilities. That may not be the, Mo the Moser Fund was originally tied to tied to um, visual enhancements, et cetera. But there is a belief that you know, since it is so old, and no one from the original Mosher family or Mosher Trust is alive, from what I have been told. Um, that should be able to use, be used for other things. And we had talked about that for some of those, um, for an electronic sorter, which is an automated materials handler. We had talked about doing some of those improvements, like um, moving some things around, creating a computer lab, doing some of those type of things potentially with that money. As far as the Empson funds, that originally was for reference material, but I need to do some digging and see what the background is and if there's still someone around that has any kind of say in how the Empson Fund is spent. Because I think that usually what my experience has been that when you have these funds that, that date way back, that you're no longer tied to the original um, purpose of those funds. It'd be really well, hard to spend that amount of money on, audio, on visual materials for patrons. That's you know way before patrons could enlarge a font, a font on a screen and see things and you had to have you know, readers and, and um, devices. But well, my guess is you're more right than wrong. I mean, I, I would guess that whatever um, governance was there through the estate has is, is passed because of the passage of time. And that um, there are those protocols that are out there that, that came from the original bequest. And it seems to me that um, if we're allowed, that may, maybe it should be an activity of the advisory board to at least put together some language as to how to um, suggest that those funds be looked at going forward and what kind of governance goes on. I don't, I don't think um, it would be in the library's best interest or the city's best interest just to throw it open and say, whatever you need, take, take from time to time, I think there's, there needs to be some oversight there, but there needs to be some rules surrounding that oversight. Yeah. 
I mean, we're right now, we're actually yeah, working out to, the, to our group. We're actually working on a concrete proposal of how to use at least um, a good chunk of the Mosher Fund. Um, we, are, we have appointments with four different vendors of automated materials handlers, which are sort, electronic sorters, um, this month and the beginning of next month. And we also were getting some estimates on some of the things that we would like to do um, as far as changes go with some of the areas in the building. So, so we wanted to come back and, and talk to the board about that and see, I think you're right, Mark. I think at that point, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather come in with a concrete list and say, here's what we'd like to do with at least some of it. Here's how much it costs. Um, at that point proposed deviating from the original, you know, visual materials. Okay, well, I, I would just say that in conjunction with that, the board needs to think about, in addition to that request, mm -hmm. how it should manage future requests. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it can't be just a carte blanche. It can't be like the friends where you come in and say, hey, I need a, you know, an X, Y, Z, and they write you a check. There, are, there should be some parameters around what's, suitable and what's not suitable. Does that make sense? Sort of. Sort of. So. I, I don't want to screw with your prerogatives, but I just think <laughs> there's a stewardship role here for the board. You do. But on, on the other hand, we, we never have, you know, we have some large ticket items that this library should have had years ago that would not fit into a friend's request or our funding. No doubt. No doubt, it would be my hope that the city would step up rather than dip into this money, but that may not be the case. Well, not since, I mean, my um, gut feeling is that they'd say, well, you have all this money, why don't you spend this on it instead, <laughs> so. That's another reason why I'm proposing that we do what we do. So there is some governance to this so that it doesn't get rated. Well, if we spend it on some things that we need, it won't it won't be there to raid. So. That's right. <laughs> yes, that's right. But you can't spend it all. So, Mark, I see Tim's hand up. Uh, the uh, the I, I don't think there's any way the city could raid this. I guess the council, I guess the council could you know somebody could put an item on the council agenda uh, for council action to change the. The, the limits or the constraints or purposes of the Mosher Fund. Um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the first correspondence I had with Jim Golden about this now almost three years ago, um, I think at that time there was like $573,000 that had accumulated. I'm, so it's north of that because it's now several years later. Um, that, was, uh, that, was, um, uh, that was growth over the original, you know, kind of principle um, that would, was available to be spent. Um, and it was my understanding at the time that, that this board could decide to change, to redefine the purposes of those, of those funds. And then in, the, in following up from the last meeting with Jim, then I got, then that email looked to me like, well, it would be a council action, but based on the recommendation of this board. But one way or another, right? Um, the, the, the opportunity exists to broaden the purpose, right? Or redefine the purpose of the funding. Um, I don't know uh, your comment a few minutes ago about, about going, uh, spending down the principle. Um, I'm not certain where that fits in all the, you know, that language, but certainly broadening the use of the earnings, right? From the time that it was, it was the fund was created. And I think probably the most, the smartest approach would be um, to, to assume that you would formulate a recommendation. I think the, the work that Nancy was talking about would be the basis for that recommendation to the council to spend X of the 500 now and 80,000 or 90,000 or 600 or whatever it is, um, at least of the earnings. If, um, if you wanted to recommend that you spend down the principal, I think that's a different conversation with Jim that we ought to get clearer on whether or not that that's the prerogative of the council. Yeah, this is just me. I'm not 
speaking on behalf of others on, on our uh, board, but, you know, I, I strongly agree that, that the, the funds should be repurposed because they're not satisfying much use right yeah. now. The, um, the reason I asked the other questions was because you sent out an email to Nancy and I that, that was from Jim Golden back in May of 2018 that was talking about the Moser Fund. And it, it has a, a bunch of information in it. And it's, it says in section three, it addresses that it can only be used for the benefit of the library. It can be used pursuant to the advice of the library board. City council has, has to designate its use. Let's see, city council has to designate its use. It indicates by resolution. An appropriation ordinance would also be required. Notice that it also does allow city council by ordinance to authorize use of the corpus as well for the library. So it has to go to the library, but they could spend it down or you could spend it down if you chose. I would, I would argue against that because then I think it depletes the asset and then there's, there's, you know, there's nothing in reserve for, for your rainy day. But um, that's with respect to the Moser Fund. I'd like to get something on paper that we recommend as a board as to how council should approach the use of this funds and um, what safeguards should be in place so that they, uh, they remain there for the use of the library going forward. That's my recommendation. And I see a lot of blank faces, so. <laughs> well, that's a recommendation to the board, right? That's not a recommendation to the council. No, that's, that's my recommendation to the board is that we put something together as a recommendation to council. Yeah. Like I said, we have multiple things that we have considered. Um, so, you know, I can put that together as a recommendation to the board. And I think going in with a recommendation of how we want to spend some of the spendable part of the fund at the same time as is as, as making sure that we can spend it is probably a good idea. So that it's not just this loose amount hanging out there. I like your idea of having some structure to that. You know, God forbid, God forbid something something happens and, and you're no longer director, Nancy. We don't want the new director coming in and saying, oh, gee, I got this pocket full of cash. I'm going to spend it all down. And then, you yeah. know, then we don't have anything for, yeah. for the... That's, oh, that's, I, wouldn't suggest, I wouldn't suggest spending spending that part of it. I would just, you know, suggest spending a portion of the whatever it's up to. Now, close to 600,000. Leave the rest to gain interest in the future. Well, I'd like to combine them both. Combine Empson and Mosher? Yeah, and, and then put a, put a common purpose to both and then uh, have some sort of fiduciary responsibility in, in the very loosest of terms where the board is responsible for at least looking at the monies once a year mm -hmm. to see mm -hmm. what the heck's there. Because I know for years and years and years, it's just that. from my observation, the board didn't have a clue as to how much mm -hmm. money was there and, and what it was doing. Tim, do you think this is a good conversation to have with Jim Golden? Yeah, I, my, I, I don't I know. Do. I mean, Jim, ultimately, I, I suspect Jim's going to say to you, well, if you have put together a proposal or recommendation, and you know, and when and, and you'd want, you know, it's going to have to come from the board, um, but put it on a council agenda, and you know, and we'll go from there uh, as new business, and come back as a resolution, and and then it would show up as one in the, you know, in the in a funding ordinance, which we do on a regular basis. So. I just think it might be helpful for us to bring him in on the conversation, and he'll he'll yeah. He'll know the specifics of what we actually should be doing and and how things should be termed, et cetera. 
Well, I'm wondering if, if we can't put together a subcommittee of the board to, to just look at it and make a recommendation to the board overall. Um, and maybe nothing comes of it, uh, but I, I think there's a lot of money there and I think it would, would be physically irresponsible for the board not to at least try and put some sort of policy in place to demonstrate that we are trying to manage it in a responsible fashion. So, so can, I, can I get a motion to put together a subcommittee to do just what I said? Can I get a motion to do something else? <laughs> Uh, I can try to reword it. Um, I move that the board puts together a subcommittee to look at how the how how the library I don't know uh, how how various funds are utilized by the library in the future. Is that what you're thinking? Or you want? Do you want it to be these specific funds? Um, let me try. Uh, I, I I move that the board puts together a subcommittee to consider a more a more flexible means of managing the monies in the Moser and Emson fund for the future use of the library. How does that sound? Second. S second, all in favor? Four, five, four out of four, okay. So can we get that in the, the notes please, Catherine? Now we need the subcommittee. Do we have any volunteers? Do we have any financial types out there? <clears throat> so I mean, we're actually looking at the funds. I thought this was more of the use I, of the monies. The use of the monies in the fund. The the governance for how the monies get used. Mark, can I ask a question? Sure. Is the is is when you use the the use of the term manage the funds suggest that you, you want to have fingerprints on how it gets invested or where it gets invested, as opposed to how it's utilized, right? Um, I, I think what you're interested in is broadening the potential use of the funds and, and, and how the library benefits from the use of those funds, as opposed to how the, how the fund is managed. Is that? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. And also, I think if you were going at it the other way, like what Tim said, if you were making suggestions as to how the funds is managed, I think you'd have to be a governing board in order to make that type of recommendation instead of an advisory no, board. That, that's beyond where I wanted to take this yeah. exercise. I just, I just wanted to, you know, there's a lot, as I said, there's a lot of money here. Um, we would be irresponsible as a board if we didn't try to put some broad parameters on the procedures by which that money gets used. And, that, and that's what I'm proposing is that, that just like we do the bylaws, you know, we put together the bylaws and we said, this is how we were gonna act as a board. And then we kicked it around and we got concurrence. And I would see that as, as the same exercise here is we put together some broad statements as to how we think this should be addressed as a board, not, not as necessarily as how Nancy would use the money, but just how we would um, manage the, um, the communication that, that goes to council to say that this is a good idea and that we think they should do it. Does that make sense? 
So I'm yeah, yes, so, so I don't think you need to be financial to do that. That's you. I mean, financial is like you're like investing it, which. No, no, yeah. no. That, okay. That, that's uh, that's uh, too far a leap, I think, and we don't we don't really have that, nor can we envision future boards having that expertise. I mean, I can put something together. I think it's probably like an annual state of the funds, right? Like something and, along those lines. I, I, would, I would say that and um, um, like, like when, um, so Nancy comes up with a great idea, it's gonna take a couple hundred thousand dollars and we're gonna dip into the funds. Does that, does that carry with majority consent of the board? Do you need super majority? Do you need unanimous consent of the board? Something like that. Do you, you know, does, does, does it not go forward unless it goes to council first and council approves it as well? Yeah, just stuff like that. You know, how, how do you, how do you demonstrate to the public that yes, we were responsible on how we manage this money. Got it. Can I ask what happens to the funds if the library becomes a district and a singular entity? Normally nothing. I mean, normally funds that are tied directly to your to a library when a library separates from a municipality and becomes a district go with it but you know once again that's there's a lot of stuff involved in looking at looking at those so yeah that may be i'm just wondering for future because if if the library separates then council's kind of like do they need to approve it still does it need to go to council probably not it's the library's money at that point right well it probably transfers to the governing board of whatever mm -hmm. that mm -hmm district becomes. Right, well, I'm just forward thinking if we put together these guidelines, they should probably include some thought into that, right? I think that's a great idea. Okay. And I, you know, this is, I don't see this as a, you know, a one and done kind of thing. I think it'll take a couple iterations till everybody feels comfortable and Nancy feels comfortable, Tim feels comfortable that we put something together that's both responsible but also workable. And we don't want to handcuff the, the library in this process, but at the same time, we want to, I think we want to be responsible as a board. I think it will take some mulling through because there there is that fine line too between the responsibilities of a an advisory board versus a governing board when you handle this. So I think that I think it's it will take a few meetings probably. Well, no doubt, and and I think I think by the way the the estates set it up, they felt that there was a role for the the advisory board, because there probably wasn't anything else to, you know, assign it to. So there it is. I mean, it's, you know, it's, there's, there's the lap that it's in. So. Take a shot at it, Katie, and it, you know, we'll kick it around. Does anybody want to help Katie? Do you want help Katie? I mean, I can put the first rough draft together and then I think we can go from there. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you, thanks, thanks for bearing with me on this. Um, I'm gonna move on unless there's other questions. Uh, number C under old business, little free ri libraries. Um, I have a little bit of info. Okay, great. And um, we were talking about looking for some spots to maybe create an indoor space so that we would not continue to have the issues that we had with the other ones in the park. And I'm not, uh, and um, 
I made a delivery this week to the suites, which is a Longmont Housing Authority affordable housing facility. And they had requested um, to have some books on hand for their residents. And we were withdrawing a whole bunch of stuff. So I, so I took a load over there and they may be one spot that's interested in future in having a, it, they have bookshelves, but it's a little free library. And, and we've had several other suggestions for, from staff that I'm looking into. Um, some are city facilities, some are not. Um, one person had on our staff had been approached with someone from Salud, the um, healthcare clinics who um, take care of a lot of our folks that are English second language. And they have had expressed some interest in having some children's books there that they could hand out to their patients slash clients. So we are, we have been looking into several different possibilities so far of kind of an indoor free library location. So we're not saying that we couldn't put a little free, a cute little free library somewhere, but, but, you know, after the third time when they were smashed to bits, it was a little bit disheartening. So maybe if they, maybe if they didn't have a meeting, that's all great, but maybe if they didn't have a meeting or the friends didn't have a meeting, we were going to throw something in front of them. Mm -hmm. as to whether they wanted to take ownership on this. Mm -hmm. And, they still, they, and ever, they still could. They could, but, I mean, but we haven't, they haven't been broached on the subject at this no, point. No, they haven't had a meeting yet. I was going to bring that up as part of my director's part of the friends meeting on Wednesday. So Okay, great. But we, great. Have, been look, we have been looking for some, some indoor locations for both adult and children's materials. Um, we... We're able since the friends have not been able to sell the lion's share of their materials this year, and we had accumulated quite a few um, donations, even though we were ostensibly not taking them for a while. People still left them on the doorstep, pretty much. Um, so we passed out, for example, a ton of um, children's materials at the free lunch programs that were at both by St. Vrain School District and Children, Youth, and Families. So, so definitely looking at some some maybe different ways kind of outside the box little free instead of just the traditional you know cute box on the stand little free libraries because I think that there are still places that could use some free books. Very good. My goal of this was to try and get the library out of the management of it. I'll pitch and, it to the friends. And, and you didn't I mean you didn't let me try this again. You are not the original recipient of the books. They are the friends. So if they were up to it, then they would be a great uh, source of books for little libraries if they chose to take on that role. Well, it's all kind of the same pot. I mean, we were taking we were taking books before to put in the little free libraries that were given as donations or that were discarded library books before they ever hit the friends. You know, people. People donate materials to the library and also um, the friends generally in their book sales don't tend to sell as many of the ex libris of the ex library books as they do some of the books that don't have the library markings and um, jackets on them. So the kind of things that we like to donate um, elsewhere potentially that end up going to a, a wholesale hauler after the friends sales when they don't sell are the things like like, you know, James Patterson has a new book out and we buy 15 copies. And then after a few months, you know, we might need to keep three of them and we have multiple copies of these materials. So those are the kind of books that we tend to, um, we do talk to the friends first. We don't just, you know, take the books, but say, hey, can we, can we appropriate some of these donations for these other purposes? And this is pretty typical in libraries I've given to, invite to teach programs, to books for Africa, to medical clinics, et, et cetera. Because we always have more books than we can then, then sell at the book sales in the Friends. Okay, well, um, yeah, I, I, it wasn't my intent to get in the middle of any of that. I was just hoping that the Friends would take a greater role in supporting the little library. So, you know, Give it have a, a conversation and see what they say. Okay, folks, this is what everybody's been waiting for. 
election of officers for the coming term. Do we have anybody that wants to make a floor speech? Does anybody have a platform that they want to put forth? Say, anybody have any recommendations? I would say don't nominate poor Cynthia in absentia because she's probably busy. <laughs> Cynthia did write me. Um, she had indicated that uh, probably in, in deference to Catherine's sufferings that she would take secretary, but she's not. But, but she's not going to take it till she comes back. About, by the way, does anybody know if she had her baby? I sent her a note and I haven't heard back from her yet. I, there was an away message that said she was going back to work at the beginning of May, but I don't know. I can try and find a, a, I can rustle up her phone number and text her. Well, there seems to be relief for whoever gets the secretarial position. Uh, that is that, very and, gracious of her. <laughs> I I was going I was also going to volunteer to do the secretary. Uh, I made it that obvious. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've done it. I don't. I you, nobody should do it twice in a row. Um, <laughs> but I can't do the I can't do the friends. Like I can't commit to two meetings. Uh, so. so you go to the friends and take minutes there. No, but if you're if you're the friends liaison. You have to go to their meeting, which oh, okay, right. that's it's usually the same week, so it's just not for does it doesn't necessarily work for me necessarily. So that's why I was going to volunteer to, to be the secretary again. It is actually a little bit easier because you can be typing on Zoom. <laughs> it is a little easier. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. So well, should we just wait and I'm fine doing it until we hear from Cynthia and kind of you two could decide between you what is preferable and I can I can manage for a while here for sure. I, I also probably can't commit to another meeting, unfortunately. I, I can still be the I'll still be the friends liaison. Yay, Kathy. I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Nobody wants to be president. Chair <laughs> Parson. You're doing a great job. You're doing job. such a great really job. job. <laughs> Have that presidential air. Well, you could be vice chairman. Um, I will share that I have decided to go to law school. So my life is going to change dramatically in the fall. So That's I can great. take on something maybe until August, but... After that, I'm probably going to have to scale back. You know, I want to stay on this board, but I don't want to commit to anything additional time wise. You should do the vice then. Yeah. <laughs> That's the least commitment. What does that say? Think of yeah. vice presidents. What do they usually do? So, so, so Kamala Harris takes exception to that. So usually what happens is the vice chairman steps in when the chairman's indisposed. Well, I could probably manage that. So, um, so let me see if I can sort this out. So Kathy still wants to be with the friends. Katie's willing to be secretary until Cynthia shows up. Catherine's willing to be vice chair. And I guess that, that means you, me. Mark. That leaves me. So, um, do we have a motion for that slate of uh, officers? Are you okay being the chairperson in all seriousness? Well, uh, I know you guys back me up, so I'm okay with it. <laughs> Uh, I will move then to to move forward with the elections of the officers as stated. <laughs> Second. Second. All in favor. Okay. So that's the officers. Um, next meeting date is February 22nd.
And um, I have an announcement for the vice chairman. I'm going to be absent that day. <laughs> so, be a good opportunity for, for you to go in there and cut your teeth. I'll start doing my homework now. <laughs> I hope well, you're doing something fun at least. You've seen how I've done it, you know it's it's not all that tough. So <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Uh, any other comments or questions from the board? Council? Nope. Nope. Nancy? No, I'm talked out. It's been a long day. <laughs> Any words of wisdom to leave us by? All right, then. Uh, I did want to mention that we did the craft bag, Nancy. Oh, it's adorable. This for was those, this for weekend's those of you craft that don't bag. Know, our children's department and some other library folks, while they're doing other things, put together hundreds of take home craft yeah. bags every we, week. And we, as many as we put out, we started out with like 25, and then we went to 50, and then we went to 100, then we went to 200, and people well, specifically to pick them up because people, I think, are just really looking for hands-on activities that don't involve more screen time. Absolutely. We look forward to them. Awesome. That one's particularly cute. Yeah, that is. I cute. know. Super cute. It is cute. And it says that emperor penguin panache. Yeah. And there have been some of them, not as frequently, but there are some um, that have been aimed at adults as well. So, nice. so we've had finger knitting and a couple other things, um, kits put together for adults, but trying to find some things that, that aren't just screen time is a good thing. But. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I was wondering if we might want to send a card to Cynthia. Do you have an address I here? I do. Okay. I don't have it right at hand right here, but I have it. I can send it around tomorrow. Okay. Okay, great. We want baby details. We want pictures. So <laughs> she was due the ninth. So hopefully she's hopefully the baby's a few weeks old. Oh yeah, let's hope so. Okay, I'd like to um, move that we adjourn at eight oh eight, and um, with the exception of the of me, we'll see you all next month. Where are you going, Mark? Uh, back to Florida. Oh, nice. Safe travels. Safe travels. Yeah, Enjoy. See, see how much virus I can get done. I hope you get your vaccine before you go. So do I. Or get tested anyway. Oh, yeah, it would be good. Well, have a safe trip. All right. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>